Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Throughout the world, there are places that seem to be destined to forever be linked to mysterious, inexplicable vanishings. From the Bermuda Triangle to the Beddington Triangle, we have triangles galore, often triangles that reach out to make people simply disappear from the face of the earth. These places are, in a sense, hungry, drawing in people who would dare to reach forth into their wilds only to keep what they have gained to never return them. One probably lesser known such place lies out across a large expanse of dusty desert and mountains in the state of Nevada, and it's a location that seems to be every bit as enigmatic and ominous as any of its brethren. It has come to be known as the Nevada Triangle, and more people have gone missing here than in any other triangle in the world. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Werewolves being spotted in Wisconsin have been reported as far back as 1936, then again in 1964, and 1972. But there had been nothing like the reports that came out of the area at Deer Delavan starting in 1989. A teen finds two dead bodies, side by side, both wearing raincoats. But the disturbing thing is that both dead men were wearing lead masks. And that's not the end of the strangeness. A woman sees something so horrifying she turns the rest of her life over to Jesus Christ so she will remain protected. But first, over 2,000 flight disappearances over the past 60 years. That's three missing planes every month. You might think I'd be referring to the Bermuda Triangle, but I'm not. There is a lesser-known but significantly more dangerous triangle near Area 51 in Nevada. We begin with that story. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Sprawled out over a vast expanse of 25,000 square miles of a desolate landscape of desert, mountains, and scrub near the Sierra Nevada Mountains and Great Basin Desert in the U.S. state of Nevada, looking as if it is the surface of another planet, is an area that has, over the years, accrued for itself a rather sinister reputation. Besides being in the vicinity of the notorious top-secret Area 51, and a range of strange UFO sightings, the region has also become a mysterious place where hundreds, perhaps even thousands, of planes have flown into never to return, earning it the ominous nickname of the Nevada Triangle after its more famous Bermuda cousin. The Nevada Triangle is typically defined as spanning from Las Vegas in the southeast to Fresno in the west and to Reno at the top. It is said that this moonscape of sparsely populated, rugged wilderness has been the site of, by some estimates, around 2,000 aircraft crashes over the past 60 or so years, 
with many of these happening under mysterious circumstances, with experienced pilots, without any clear reason, and with wreckage never found. In some cases, these have been rather large, rugged military aircraft such as B-24 Liberators or B-17 Flying Fortresses. That averages out to about three planes disappearing per month over the last 60 years, far more than have ever disappeared in the more infamous Bermuda Triangle. By far the most famous such crash to happen within the Nevada Triangle is that of the billionaire maverick businessman, sailor, aviator, and adventurer James Stephen Steve Fawcett. Famous for a wide range of world records, such as being the first person to fly solo non-stop around the world in a balloon, as well as more than 100 other records concerning non-stop circumnavigations of the Earth, as well as aviation and sailing, Fawcett was also a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and the Explorers Club. He was an extremely talented pilot with several models of aircraft on which he had clocked countless hours of flight time and was well-respected in the world of aviation. There was certainly no disputing his impressive experience. On September 3, 2007, Fawcett departed from the Flying M Ranch in Nevada in a single-engine Super Decathlon light aircraft for what was to be a quick round-trip joy flight, with a planned return to the same airport from which he had departed shortly after. At the time, no one thought anything of it. After all, this was one of the most decorated and well-respected aviators in the world on a routine flight under clear conditions. There should have been no problems at all. When Fawcett failed to return at the designated time, people began to worry. An intense, complex search was launched to try and find him, which stretched on for a month as authorities scoured a 20,000-square-mile area of harsh, forbidden wasteland, but they found no trace of where Fawcett or his plane had gone, not even a scrap. Although the search was one of the largest, costliest, and well-publicized in U.S. history, not a single piece of wreckage was ever turned up, nor was there any indication of a transmission from the aircraft's emergency locator transmitter, although the search team did turn up a number of other planes crashed out in the desert that had been forgotten and missing for decades. The search for Fawcett was officially called off on September 19, 2007, although aircraft would be kept on standby to respond to any anomalous crash sites that turned up. But by this time, Fawcett was largely thought to be most certainly dead. On October 2, 2007, the search was called off for good. Many had still not given up on Fawcett, as private search flights were still going on, including even a team of psychics on the case. And on August 23, 2008, a massive search on foot was launched based on new information that had turned up. But like those before them, nothing was ever found. In the meantime, the strange disappearance had caused wild theories to swirl around it, some believed that Fawcett had faked his own death in order to start a new life somewhere else, while others believed that he had been shot down by the military when he got too close to Area 51, that he had entered some sort of strange vortex, or even that he had been abducted by aliens. In the end, nobody knew. Then, on September 29, 2008, a hiker stumbled by chance across some of Fawcett's belongings out in the wilderness, including a crumpled-up FAA-issued card, a Soaring Society of America membership card, and a rather large clump of $1,005 in cash. The items were found in a bleak, remote area located around 65 miles from where Fawcett had taken off. With this exciting clue, search efforts were renewed, and on October 1st, an aerial search located the wreckage of the plane, around 750 yards from where the belongings had been found. Follow-up searches were unable to locate Fawcett's body, although two human bones were discovered that were found through DNA analysis to have belonged to him. The rest of the remains were thought to have perhaps been dragged away by scavengers 
and scattered across the landscape to never be found. Examination of the aircraft turned up no evidence of any sort of equipment malfunction, and the crash was blamed on a combination of extreme downdrafts of up to 400 miles per hour, pummeling the light aircraft, proving no match for it, as well as the altitude and disorienting mountain terrain. Indeed, it is the shifting, sudden fury of the area's weather that has been offered up as one of the reasons so many planes go missing here. The Sierra Nevada mountains run perpendicular to the jet stream, or high Pacific winds, which conspire with the sheer, high-altitude peaks and wedge-shaped range to create volatile, unpredictable winds and downdrafts that can wreak havoc on smaller aircraft. The weather phenomena is sometimes called the mountain wave and can literally pluck up airplanes from the air and toss them down to go hurtling into the earth like toys. Another factor could be simple pilot error, with inexperienced pilots not quite knowing how to handle the turbulence or the disorienting mountainous terrain of the area, with its sharp canyons and soaring cliffs. Indeed, many pilots who have nearly crashed in the Nevada Triangle near the Sierra Nevada have reported experiencing a deep sense of confusion and profound disorientation during their flights. Professor Kelly Redmond, a climatologist with the Desert Research Institute in Reno, has looked at wind formations in those mountains seeking answers. Redmond told KNPR that much of the problem in the Sierra Nevada is because of the wind. The mountain range runs almost perpendicular to the jet stream that, along with their shape, which is wedge-like, creates wild wind conditions. So when the winds are coming up, they come up kind of smoothly on the west side, and then they have this very rapid descent and there is a tremendous amount of turbulence that can be caused by such situations," Redmond said. He said when a small plane, which must fly lower than commercial jets and doesn't have enough power, gets caught in that airflow, it can be difficult to get out. It's quite easy for a small plane to get caught in the downdraft on the downwind side and not have the power or just the capability to get out of the way of that," Redmond said. He compared it to getting caught in Niagara Falls. However, Redmond said that it's not always the case and that many smaller planes are piloted by people who have a lot less experience than commercial pilots. As a result, pilot error could be blamed for the hundreds of plane crashes in the area. Although calling it the Nevada Triangle, evoking the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle and its proximity to Area 51, which some people believe the government uses to house UFOs, may create images of paranormal activity, Redmond says it's more likely geography and wind patterns that are really to blame. The mountains of the Great Basin and especially in the Sierra Nevada are fairly tall, he said. That, along with incised canyons and sharp cliff faces, create hazardous flying. So it's quite easy for a small thing, such as a light aircraft, to get lost in such surroundings," Redmond said. In the end, no one is quite sure of why so many planes have gone down here, some of them quite large planes rather than light aircraft and with experienced crews under ideal conditions, nor even how many planes have actually gone down here, and the area has managed to create an air of mystique around itself. Many still insist that there are forces beyond our understanding at work here, pulling in planes to their doom. Talk of the Nevada Triangle is often punctuated with mentions of Area 51, aliens or top-secret tests of experimental aircraft, as well as the possibility of some form of magnetic anomaly or a vortex of some type. Adding to the mysterious quality of the region is that many of the crashed planes have never been found. This is most likely due to the inaccessibility of the remote area, but sometimes things are stranger. One Army finder pilot, Lt. Leonard C. Leiden, said he parachuted from his plane when his squadron got hopelessly lost in the mountains here. He claimed to have clearly seen the P-40 fighter go down about a mile from his position, near the Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, and was sure that he knew where it crashed. However, when a search team returned to the area he specified, 
no sign of any wreckage or the plane could be found. So what's going on here? Is it aliens? The government covering up its top-secret Area 51? Magnetic anomalies or something even stranger? Or are we just dealing with freaky weather that has a penchant for crushing smaller aircraft coupled with the remote, unforgiving wastelands? There will probably always be tales of places on this planet that disappear people without a trace. We may not ever know the reasons why or how, but they will always capture our imagination. These places will always lie out there, just beyond our reach and beyond our current capacity to comprehend them. But it's more than just planes that disappear. It's also people. Then I pulled out a map of Nevada and California and almost fell out of my seat because the largest cluster zone we've established is in that Nevada Triangle, and there's two other cluster zones also in that triangle, said David Paulides, investigator and author of Missing 411 books. For nine years, former police officer turned author David Paulides has scoured through about 20,000 missing persons files. Based on very specific criteria, he has whittled them down to about 1,200 seemingly inexplicable mysteries, people who vanish under unusual circumstances. In a series of books, Missing 411, Polides has identified dozens of clusters, many of them national parks or forests where the number of missing is way up out of the ordinary. Three of those clusters exist within the Nevada Triangle, including, at the top of the list, Yosemite National Park. There's no concrete one item that can say this is causing that, and because of no tracks, no scent trail, no witnesses, we've had people say it's got to be UFOs, it's got to be reptilians, Bigfoot, it's got to be this. In reality, I don't think you can say it's just one thing, Paulides said. Often, the missing vanishes into thin air while with other hikers. Dogs are unable to pick up any scent of them. There are no tracks. Small children who vanish are found a day later, many miles away, over mountain ranges. Human abductions and animal attacks have been ruled out. For years, Paulides requested lists of the missing from the National Park Service, but was told they don't keep any such list. More recently, Yosemite officials have opened up. It might be ten years later you find a shoe, a piece of clothing, said Scott Gediman, Yosemite National Park Ranger. Paulides has investigated cases closer to home, including the 1966 disappearance of six-year-old Larry Jeffrey of Henderson, who vanished while with his family on Mount Charleston, and a 1977 case of a missing woman near Tonopah. Some have tried to link the mystery to the Area 51 military base, but that facility is far to the east of the Triangle's boundaries. While speaking to a national conference of search and rescue experts, Paulides was addressed by a pair of state troopers. They said, Dave, you're talking about things that nobody in this room wants to talk about. Everybody knows it's going on. Everybody here faces it, but nobody wants to talk about it. Coming up, a woman sees something so horrifying she turns the rest of her life over to Jesus Christ so she will remain protected. But first, a teen finds two dead bodies, side by side, both wearing raincoats. But the disturbing thing is that both dead men were wearing lead masks, and that's not the end of the strangeness. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. 
If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. It's 1966. Jorge da Costa Alves finds himself flying a kite one afternoon in the nearby Ventum Hill in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. As the 18-year-old Jorge walks around Ventum Hill, he makes the macabre discovery of two bodies laying side by side in the tall weeds. The bodies were of two men who appeared to be dressed identically. Both men were dressed in matching suits and wearing raincoats which wasn't out of the ordinary, since the area had been drenched by recent showers. What was out of the ordinary were the protective lead masks over their faces, the types of masks used to protect against radiation poisoning. Here, laying dead in the rain-soaked vegetation of Ventum Hill, are two men in suits, raincoats, and lead masks over their faces. As young Jorge realizes that he just stumbled onto two dead bodies, he makes his way to the nearest phone to call in the find. The local police and journalists tried to put the puzzle pieces together from what little evidence they had, only to come out scratching their heads. Forty-five years later, the mystery, known as the Lead Masks case, is still riddled with theories such as suicide, murder, even alien abduction. Manuel Pereira de Cruz and Miguel José Viana were electrical engineers who made a living repairing televisions. As the story goes, the men lived in an area north of Rio de Janeiro. They were good friends and were often seen working together. On August 17, 1966, the men had mentioned to their relatives that they needed to buy some supplies for work and would be gone for the afternoon. The men then hopped on a bus heading to Niteroi three hours and 160 miles away. Three days later, on August 20th, Jorge stumbles upon the bodies of the two television repairmen. Police and journalists make their way to the bodies only to find them in a severe state of decomposition. Immediately, the investigation makes note of what was found near the bodies – an empty bottle of water, a package containing two towels and a notebook with what's described as a cryptic note. 16.30 hours be at the determined place. 18.30 swallow capsule after effect protect metals wait for mask signal. I wonder what the detectives thought when they read that cryptic note. Suicide? Maybe. But what about the lead masks? Murder then? If Manuel Pereira and Miguel Jose were murdered, what was the purpose? Obviously, money would be an objective, but I doubt both men had a lot of it. Could it be some form of cult-like suicide? No mention of any cult or religious activity has ever been pinned to these dead men by friends or relatives. If we step out of our realm for a momentary alternate explanation, we can ask if the men were time travelers. Could these men have been ages ahead of 1960s technology and actually found a way to travel through time. This theory is a popular one when discussing the Lead Masks case. People speculate that since both Manuel and Miguel were fascinated with UFOs and electronics, maybe they found a way to bend space and time in some such manner that allowed them to glimpse or visit distant worlds. Which sounds like a far-out theory, of course, 
Reminds me of some other scientist, one who wore a permeable coat and radiation protection mask as well. But come on, let's get serious for a moment. We all know what this mystery is about, don't we? I'm talking about UFOs, people. Both Manuel Pereira and Miguel Jose were avid UFO enthusiasts who were aware that 160 miles away was a recent UFO hotspot. Ventum Hill was known as a local UFO hotspot after many residents claimed to have witnessed strange and aerial lights. As one theory suggested, the men were in contact with extraterrestrials and had made the 160-mile final destination with the intent of committing suicide to join the mothership. I wonder if Manuel and Miguel also wore Nike shoes and had a roll of quarters in their pockets. Yes, I'm referring to the Heaven's Gate suicide photo with the members shown wearing Nike shoes, something of a pop culture phenomenon, I suppose. Of course, I use it not to make light of the mass suicide that occurred in 1997, but to point out that the Heaven's Gate cult believed that suicide would assist them in getting on board an extraterrestrial mothership which they believed was following the comet hale -Bopp. Maybe this is how E.T. harvests humans, by communicating with us telepathically and telling us that in order for us to hitch a ride with them, we must kill ourselves first. If that's the case, E.T. is one evil trolling son of a gun. So then what really happened on Ventum Hill? Did the men make contact with a UFO? Or were they the victims of a robbery gone wrong? If we opt to go with the robbery explanation, then what do you make of the cryptic note, the distance traveled by the men, and the fact that no signs of foul play were found? Now, if you were to go with the UFO explanation, then you'll be surprised to learn that residents in Ventum Hill had reported seeing strange UFO-like lights near the vicinity in which Jorge, the kite-flying teenager, had his world flipped upside down when he met the men in the lead masks. Have you ever been so scared to talk about something that even thinking about it brings fear? I was never a believer in God or the devil. Playing in the graveyard at night and going into so-called haunted houses, it never scared me. Then I saw the real thing, and I am now a devoted Christian. It all started after I got released from the hospital, after a close call with death from my heart stopping from malnutrition. As my body shut down, I died for a few seconds and was brought back. When I died, there was nothing special at least nothing that I could recall. After I got released from the hospital, I was in a hopelessly dark state. The doctors made me go to a therapist in order to get released, and I had to start eating better. So a few days later, around 3 or 4 a.m., I felt something menacing around me. When I opened my eyes, I saw in the doorway a very tall, skinless, humanoid creature peering at me. Its eyes were wide and jet black, and its teeth were jagged. I smelt the smell of burnt flesh and something else, decay. The creature was around eight to nine feet tall as it arched in my doorway. You could see the muscles and some kind of malleable substance oozing out from between the tendons. I knew it could reach out and grab my throat with its long fingers. I felt like I was walking a thin line of death. I knew he was there to take me to the hell that was awaiting me. And I wasn't surprised, for I had been a really bad person and was way into the satanic stuff. Yet I never felt or saw anything so bone-chilling until this moment. A few minutes of the creature just breathing and me looking at it with pure dread. Suddenly, I felt a release as I screamed and clawed at my eyes only to have my dad slam through the doorway and the feeling and that awful creature were gone. After that, I am now sleepless at night. I went to a therapist and drew her a picture of that dreadful creature. She was alarmed enough from that drawing to go directly to a priest and his whole church prayed for me. 
I was informed to avoid and block myself from anything that could make it appear again. No scary movies, no Ouija boards. Going to church became an every Sunday thing and praying nightly. So far it has not returned, and I have not seen anything like it again. Werewolves being spotted in Wisconsin have been reported as far back as 1936, and then again in 1964 and 1972, but there had been nothing like the reports that came out of the area near Delavan, Wisconsin, starting in 1989. The Bray Road Beast, up next on Weird Darkness. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marler. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marler on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marler. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The mythological belief in werewolves has been with us for centuries. Many historians and folklorists have pondered the origins of the belief in lycanthropy, which is really the human ability to change into not only wolves, but bears, big cats, and other dangerous creatures. Of all of these transformations, though, that of man into wolf is the best known. This is largely due to the old world traditions of wolves being feared as predators by the Europeans. There are many historical accounts of wolves preying on human beings during wars and hard winters, although not all of these accounts can be taken as fact. However, the true accounts were prevalent enough that the French had a word for the wolf that has acquired a taste for human flesh, the werewolf or the loup guru. Although modern naturalists and wildlife experts would all agree that the wolf has gained an unfair reputation over the years, centuries of stories and links to the dark side have maintained most people's fears about these creatures. In Northern Europe, wolfmen, or berserkers, which were warriors clad in animal skins, were greatly feared for this viciousness and the slaughtering of other warriors and innocents alike. In the Baltic and Slavic regions of Europe, people worshipped a wolf deity that could be benevolent or deadly without warning. As Christianity rose to power, the church condemned such beliefs, and soon the wolf was seen as a symbol of evil. Many debated over whether or not men really turned into wolves, or if Satan merely caused witnesses to be deluded into thinking a man had changed into a wolf. For those who claimed such powers, their delusions were frighteningly real. Many people who believed themselves to be werewolves testified under torture and otherwise of murdering both people and animals while in their transformed state. For this reason, many researchers today have associated being a werewolf with those deemed to be murderously mentally ill. Among these were serial killers like Stubb Peter, who was tried in Germany in 1589 for a 25-year crime spree. During that time, he murdered adults and children, including his own son, committing cannibalism and incest, and attacked animals. 
Peter claimed to have made a pact with Satan, who had then given him an animal pelt that would change him into a wolf. In 1598, French authorities arrested Jacques Roulet after he was found hiding in some brush and covered with the blood of a mutilated teenaged boy. Roulet claimed that he had killed the boy while transformed into a werewolf. With tales such as this, lycanthropy has been deemed as a serious mental disorder. But can we really place all accounts of werewolves into a category of human dysfunction? There are sightings and accounts that do exist, although few of them, that lead researchers to ponder whether or not man-wolves can actually be real. In reality, these creatures should not exist, but so much of our understanding of these creatures comes from anthropologists and folklorists, not to mention the movies, and since these sensible people would never believe that a werewolf could possibly be seen, they naturally dismiss any true accounts that might surface. This is not to say that werewolves are real. I leave such decisions for you to judge, but there are some accounts out there that just might have you thinking twice. Remember that werewolves are only slightly less implausible than many other creatures that people claim to see, from Bigfoot to giant winged creatures, but most of us have a lot less trouble believing in the other assorted monsters said to wander the land. The stories that follow do not amount to trying to convince you that true werewolves are prowling America, just that it's worthy of interest. One of the first Wisconsin werewolf sightings occurred in 1936. A man named Mark Shackleman reportedly encountered a talking wolfman just east of Jefferson, Wisconsin on Highway 18. As he was driving along the road one evening, he spotted a figure digging in an old Indian mound. He looked closer and saw that the figure was a strange, hair-covered creature that stood erect, more than six feet tall. The face of the creature boasted a muzzle and features of both an ape and a dog. Its hands were oddly formed with a twisted thumb and three fully formed fingers. The beast gave off a putrid smell that was like decaying meat. Shackleman returned to the site the following evening, hoping for another look, and this time he actually heard the creature speak in what he described as being neo-human. The beats uttered a three-syllable growling noise that sounded like Gadara, with the emphasis on that second syllable. Shackleman was a religious man, and after spotting this obviously evil creature, he began to back away from it and began praying. Eventually, the creature was lost to sight. But did it turn up again? In 1964, another man, Dennis Fulis, had a similar sighting less than two miles away. Fulis was driving home around midnight from his job at the Admiral Television Corporation in Harvard, Illinois. After turning onto Highway 89 from Highway 14, his headlights caught an animal running across the road in front of him. It was dark brown in color, and he estimated that it weighed between four and 500 pounds. He also described it as being seven or eight feet tall, it ran across the highway, jumped a barbed wire fence, and vanished. Fulis returned to the spot in the daylight hours to look for footprints or other evidence, but the hard, sun-dried ground offered nothing. They did find where the corn had been pushed aside as the beast entered the field, though. I was awful scared that night, Fulis told author Jay Rath. That was no man. It was all hairy from head to feet. In 1972, a werewolf returned to Wisconsin. One night, a woman in rural Jefferson County called the police to report an attempted break-in at her home. According to an investigation conducted by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, she said the intruder was a large, unknown animal that had come to the house and had tried to get in the door. The creature departed but returned again a few weeks later and injured one of her farm animals. The account stated that the creature had long, dark hair, stood about eight feet tall, and walked upright like a man. Its arms were long, and it had claws on each hand. After trying to enter the house, the beast went out to the barn and attacked a horse that was stabled there. 
It left behind a deep gash on the animal that stretched from one shoulder to the other. A footprint left behind was more than a foot long. Bigfoot investigators dismissed the report, saying that a Sasquatch would never be that aggressive. But what about a werewolf? Perhaps the most celebrated and strange werewolf reports of recent years again come from Wisconsin and involve what has been dubbed the Bray Road Beast. The first sighting to go public occurred, perhaps fittingly, on October 31, 1999. A young woman named Doris Dean Gibson from nearby Elkhorn was driving along Bray Road near Delavan. As she neared the intersection of Hospital Road, she leaned over to change the station on her radio when she felt her right front tire jump off the ground as if she had hit something. Concerned, she stopped the car and got out to see what it was. Finding nothing on the roadway behind her car, she began to look around. As she peered into the darkness, she suddenly saw a dark, hairy form racing toward her. She did not see what the figure looked like from the distance at which she was standing about 50 feet, but she did see the figure was quite bulky, and she would later compare the form to someone who works out continually with weights. Startled by the oncoming form and by the sound of its heavy feet, she quickly retreated to her car. She jumped in and was attempting to drive away when the beast jumped onto her trunk. Luckily, it was too wet for the creature to hang on and it fell off onto the pavement. Doris Dean returned to the site later that evening with a young girl that she was taking out trick-or-treating and saw a large form on the side of the road. When she saw the creature moving, she ordered the child to lock her door and drove quickly away from the scene. She had no idea what she had seen, but wondered if perhaps it might be a bear, angry because she had struck it with her car. Regardless, she told a neighbor about the encounter the next day and showed her the scratched car. As word spread, more local people began to step forward with their own encounters with the beast, dating back to 1989. One night in the fall of that year, 24-year-old bar manager Lorianne Andrizi was rounding a curve on Bray Road, just a half mile from the site of the later incident, and saw what she thought was a person kneeling and hunched over on the side of the road. When she slowed down, she took a closer look at the figure on the passenger side of the car. She was no more than six feet away from it at the time. The sighting lasted for about 45 seconds, and she stated that she clearly saw a beast with grayish-brown hair, fangs, and pointed ears. His face was long and snouty, like a wolf. She also noted that even though the car's headlights were pointed ahead down the roadway, the creature's eyes glowed with a yellowish color, just like an animal's will do when reflecting car lights. Like Doris Gibson, she also said how wide and powerful the creature's chest and build were. She went on to add that the arms of the beast were rather strange. They were jointed as a man's would be and it seemed to be holding food with its palms upward, completely unlike any animal she'd ever heard of. The arms were muscular, like a man who had worked out a little bit, she said, and the creature seemed to have human-like fingers with claws on the ends. She did not notice any sort of tail, but did say that its back legs were behind it, like a person would be if kneeling. Andresi was completely unnerved by the sighting. She later stated in an interview that the creature appeared to be so human-like that it was scary. Her own answer to what she had seen was that it had to have been a freak of nature. She had no idea what it could have been until she saw a book at the library that had an illustration of a werewolf in it. It so closely resembled what she had seen on Bray Road that her eyes popped out of her head, she said. After hearing Doris Gibson's account by way of rumor, Andresi contacted the Lakeland Animal Shelter and her mother contacted a local newspaper writer named Linda Godfrey, hoping that publicity might encourage other people who had encountered the creature to come forward. The story that followed was published on December 29, 1991, and while it contained basic information about the Gibson and Andresi sightings, using pseudonyms for the two women, it also included some scanty information on other sightings. 
It also mentioned that chickens had been stolen, and then another family who lived near Bray Road that had experienced their own close encounter with the beast. Karen Bowie, who actually lived along Bowers Road, stated that her daughter Heather, age 11, had seen the creature back in 1989. They had been playing outside and thought they had spotted a large dog, until it stood up. She mentioned the odd shape of its back legs and the speed at which it could move. The County Humane Officer, John Fredrickson, told the reporter that he believed the creature was a coyote, but he did concede that there were a lot of people who believed that they had seen something out of the ordinary. He admitted that he was not sure what to make of it. Predictably, large media outlets picked up the story and the witnesses began to suffer from practical jokes and laughter. Werewolf signs were planted in front yards and werewolf parties became common, even at the bar where Andreezy worked. Monster t-shirts were sold and tourists cruised up and down Bray Road hoping for a glimpse of the creature. As time went by, though, the excitement decreased and the temper of the community began to wear thin. Despite all the jokes and humor, there was still an undercurrent of fear in Delavan and Elkhorn. Something was going on out in the vicinity of Bray Road, and soon people began to whisper about other things as well. Just the summer before the wolf creature had been reported, a dozen or so animals had been dumped in a ditch along nearby Willow Road. John Fredrickson, the humane officer from Delavan, stated that he believed several of the animals had been used in cult rituals. While Lynn Police Chief James Jensen dismissed this idea in June 1991, Fredrickson insisted that officials were missing the point. According to the officer, some of the animals had ropes tied around their back legs and their throats were slit. Some were decapitated, others were dismembered in various ways. The most recently killed animal was a dog that had its chest cavity split open and its heart removed. Several of the animals matched descriptions of recently missing pets, and they certainly had not been killed by passing cars. The mutilated carcasses were almost immediately covered up. Literally. The site was quickly bulldozed, ending Fredrickson's investigation, but it did not end the whispers and rumors that followed. Other reports began to reach Fredrickson that summer as well. Rumors were passed on about humane officer imposters who pursued stray dogs. One incident also involved an unidentified man in a black uniform driving a large black car who attempted to intimidate a child who was home alone into giving up his black Labrador retriever. Around this same time, there were also reports of occult graffiti being found in an abandoned house and at the local cemetery, where grave markers were also found to be covered with candle wax. The abandoned house was located just a quarter mile off Bray Road. This led many to ponder whether the satanic activity and the Bray Road beast were in some way connected. The strange stories and animal carcasses had been whispered about and discovered just a few months before the first sightings of the monster had been publicized, but the beast was apparently in the vicinity long before that. An earlier sighting of something was made by a dairy farmer from Elkhorn named Scott Bray, who reportedly saw a strange-looking dog in his pasture near Bray Road in September or October of 1989. He said that the beast was larger and taller than a German shepherd and had pointed ears, a hare tail, and long gray and black hair. He added that it was built very heavy in the front, as if it had a strong chest. He followed the dog to a large pile of rocks, but the creature had vanished. He did find that it had left behind huge footprints, though, which disappeared into the grass of the pasture. Russell Guest of Elkhorn also reported seeing the creature about the same time as the Scott Bray sighting. He was about a block or so away from an overgrown area, and when he heard weeds being rustled, he looked up to see a creature emerge from the thicket. It was standing on its hind feet and then took two wobbly steps forward before Guest began to run away. He looked back to see that the creature was now on all fours, but it never gave chase. After a short distance, it wandered off in the direction of Bray Road. 
Guests said that the creature was much larger than a German shepherd and was covered with black and grayish hair. While standing upright, it appeared to be about five feet tall. It had an oversized dog or wolf-like head with a big neck and wide shoulders. The animal's form was mostly dog-like, leading guests to surmise that it was some sort of dog-wolf hybrid. Around Christmas 1990, Heather Bowie had her previously mentioned encounter. She had no idea that she had seen the same thing as Doris Gibson until she heard the young woman talking about it on the school bus. The driver, Pat Lester, who happened to be Lori and Reese's mother, coincidence, listened to the girl's story and passed it on to Linda Godfrey. The reporter then contacted Karen Bowie, also a school bus driver, and mentioned the sighting in the newspaper. Heather elaborated on the encounter to Scarlett Sankey. The sight occurred around 4.30 p.m. as Heather and several friends were returning home from sledding near Loveland Road, about a mile and a half southeast of the intersection of Bray and Hospital Roads. They happened to look up and see what appeared to be a large dog walking along a creek in a snow-covered cornfield. Heather estimated it was about a block away from them. Thinking it was a dog, the children began calling to it. The creature looked at them and then stood up on its hind legs. She described it as being covered with long, silverfish-like brownish hair. The beast took four awkward steps in their direction and then dropped down on all fours and began to run at the children in what Heather later described as being a bigger leap than dogs run. It followed the group about halfway to the Bowie home, about 250 yards away, before it ran off in another direction. In March 1990, an Elkhorn dairy farmer named Mike Etten spotted something unusual along Bray Road one early morning around 2 a.m. In the moonlight, Etten, who admitted that he had been drinking at the time, saw a dark-haired creature that was bigger than a dog, just a short distance from the Hospital Road intersection. Whatever the creature was, it was sitting like a raccoon sits, he said, using its front paws to hold on to something that it was eating. As he passed by the creature, it lifted its head and looked at him. He described the head as being thick and wide, with a snout that was not as long as a dog's. The body was covered with dark, thick hair, and its legs were big and thick. Not being able to identify the animal, Etten assumed that it was a bear. However, when the other sightings of the Bray Road Beast were made public in 1991, he had to reconsider his assumption. One of the last reported encounters with the creature occurred in early February 1992. It happened around 10.30 p.m. on Highway H, about six miles southwest of the Bray and Hospital Roads intersection. A young woman named Tammy Bray, who worked for a retirement home, was driving along when a large dog-like animal crossed the road in front of her. She quickly punched the brakes and slid to a stop just about the same time the creature turned and looked at her. She described the creature as having a broad chest and pointed ears, being covered with matted brown and black fur. The narrow nose, thick neck, and shining yellow eyes of the beast quickly convinced her she was not looking at any sort of dog. Finally, it continued on, unafraid, across the road, and she noted that it walked strong in front, more slouchy, sloppy-like in the rear. Tammy drove home and hurried into the house to tell her husband, Scott Bray, that she had seen the same animal that he had seen earlier in their pasture. The sightings eventually died out, but the strangeness that seemed to envelop the region took a little longer to fade. In January 1992, just as furor over the Bray Road Beast sightings was starting to quiet down, a local reputable businessman told reporter Linda Godfrey that he'd seen two bright lights emitting sparks and moving erratically across the sky above Delavan. Later that spring, four or five horses that were pastured near Elkhorn were found with their throats slashed. John Fredrickson, who investigated, was quoted as saying that they were almost surgical-type wounds, and then after that things became eerily quiet. So what was the Bray Road Beast? Neither a coyote 
or the native red wolf can really match the descriptions that were given of the creature, despite humane officer John Fredrickson's comments that a coyote might rear up on its hind legs before running, explaining several witnesses' claims that it walked on two legs. A gray wolf would be much larger than a red wolf, but they're not generally found in the area. In addition, gray wolves are much narrower in the chest than the Bray Road creature was reported to be, and wolves are shy of humans, and despite the matching yellow eyes, would not attack a car as the creature from the Doris Gibson encounter did. The creature simply resembled no known animals, but alternately was compared to dogs, bears, and wolves. According to Jerome Clark, Dan Grobner of the International Wolf Research Center in Ellie, Minnesota, stated that the creature could not be a wild wolf. Witnesses also insisted that it was not a dog, although some suggested that it could have been a wolf-dog hybrid of some sort. But how does this explain the creature's habit of kneeling, walking on two legs, and holding on to food with the flat of its paws turned upward? Also, Lori and Treasy claimed that the animal had human-like fingers. The idea the monster may have been a bear is also called into question. While bears do occasionally walk short distances on two legs, they do not hold food with their palms up, they do not jump onto moving cars, and very rarely do they pursue or try to attack humans. So what could it have been? To find possible answers to that, we have to look outside of the normal confines of zoology. Researcher Richard Hendricks points to a creature that was suggested by Lauren Coleman and Jerome Clark called the Shanka Warrigan. The creature was said to have lived in the wilds of the Upper Midwest and was a wolf-like animal that was known to the Native American population and to the early settlers in the region. The creature was named by the Iowa Indians, and its name meant carrying off dogs. Little is known for sure about the creature, but apparently it was quite fierce, and for a while, a mounted specimen of one was exhibited at various times in the West Yellowstone area and in a small museum near Henry Lake in Idaho. Interestingly, the dog hyena type creature fits many of the descriptions of witnesses in southeastern Wisconsin, including its strange look, which would have made many compare it to a wolf or dog mix. Its dark, shaggy fur and a sloping weakness to its back legs, which was noted in almost every report. But even if we accept the possibility that this creature could have been one of the rare and possibly extinct Shunkawurrican, then how do we still explain the fact that it picked up its food with its paws or hands and walked about on two legs? If the Bray Road beast was real, it had to have been some sort of creature that has never been classified before or, more incredible to believe, a genuine werewolf. Investigator Todd Roll was quick to point out the hints that there may have been an occult connection to the Bray Road Beast. The discovery of the mutilated animal carcasses and the occult activity at the cemetery and the abandoned house coincided with the sightings of the monster in the region. Do we dare consider the idea that the beast was a shapeshifter of some sort, blending between man and wolf? There is also one more theory that we can consider, that the entire thing could have been an elaborate hoax. Notwithstanding the fact that Doris Gibson's encounter took place on Halloween, there were other problems as well. The most obvious issue to cause suspicion was the relationships between all of those involved in the case. Andreese's mother, Pat Lester, is a central figure in the case. In addition to being one witness's mother, She was also Gibson's neighbor and drove the school bus that Gibson, Heather Bowie, and Russell Guest rode. Heather's mother was also a school bus driver. Tammy Bray was also a friend of Pat Lester's daughter and the wife of Scott Bray. It was also Lester who took the initiative to contact the newspaper about the sightings. However, it should be strongly pointed out that Lester never tried to influence the reports of the witnesses. It seems more likely that she was simply in a position to hear about the encounters, and her interest and compassion towards those involved helped to encourage them to go public. So could they have been making the whole thing up? Sure, they could have been, 
but it doesn't seem likely, especially based on the fact that no one had anything to gain by making the sightings public, other than ridicule and embarrassment, which is hardly an incentive to make your story known. As time has passed, the investigation into the case has grown cold and with no further sightings of the Bray Road Beast to continue the news story, the papers have fallen silent. One has to wonder if we will ever know the truth of what happened in southeastern Wisconsin between 1989 and 1992, but the mystery at this point remains unsolved. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Case of the Lead Masks was written by Xavier Ortega. My Skinless Demon was by Gay Lalu. People Go Missing in the Nevada Triangle is by George Knapp, Matt Adams, Joe Shuneman, and Brent Swanser. And The Bray Road Beast and Werewolves of Wisconsin was written by Troy Taylor. Again, you can find links to these stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Revelation 21 verse 5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And a final thought from Jeremy Goldberg, courage is knowing it might hurt and doing it anyway. Stupidity is the same, and that's why life is hard. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.